I am now going to turn it over to our presenters, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Mahoney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction, Jamie. We appreciate it. Um, so these are our disclosures and the disclosures of other planners who are involved. Learning objectives, which you I believe are familiar with from the um, invite that you were sent. And what we plan on covering. Um, so I will start with the overview of seasonal affective disorder. We'll turn it over to Dr. Mahoney for the biological interventions. And then it will come back to me for psychological interventions and we will end with the question and answer portion. So first we will begin with an overview of seasonal affective disorder. So seasonal affective disorder actually falls under major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder as a specifier. The specifier is called with seasonal pattern. Um, in order to qualify, it has to have been present over the past two years. Um, there must be a correlation between the onset and remission and time of year that's consistent. Um, for most people, this happens, the onset occurs in fall or winter and remission in spring. It would be a lot more unusual or atypical for it to be summer onset, um, but could occur. Um, it cannot be due to seasonal stressors. So if somebody has work that correlates with a time of year or school stressors, that would not qualify. Um, for seasonal pattern because it's due to those stressors. Um, the individual cannot have had non-seasonal major depressive episodes in the past two years. And then um, finally, the lifetime occurrence of seasonal major depressive disorder is higher than non-seasonal major depressive disorder. Continuing on um, for the DSM-5, um, the DSM-5 states that common symptoms are prominent energy, hypersomnia, overeating, weight gain, and a craving of carbohydrates. Um, currently, there's more limited information on the prevalence rates for major depressive disorder versus bipolar. Um, but according to the DSM, it does seem to be more correlated with bipolar 2 than bipolar 1 disorder. People in higher latitudes and people who are younger tend to be more at risk of getting the um, seasonal mood patterns, which is an interesting fact for the DSM. And then according to Rowan, SAD represents 10 to 20% of um, those people that do have that recurrent depression. Switching gears a bit to pre prevalence rates. Um, so I led into the fact that it's more common at higher latitudes, and that's something that you'll see in these statistics. Um, so they, these authors reviewed literature on prevalence estimates for seasonal affective disorder. In the United States, it was found to be prevalent for 1% of the population overall. For Alaska at 64 degrees north, there was a 9.2% prevalence. Another interesting statistic is that the old border Amish in Pennsylvania had prevalence rates that were lower at 0.84% than a nearby population in Maryland, which is 4.3%. Um, and I believe Dr. Mahoney, you're gonna to touch on this a bit later, um, but these authors believed that it was due to them living more of a rural lifestyle and having more of that um, natural light cycle. So the day night cycle that they would be um, exposed to. So looking at some other statistics for the United States, um, New Hampshire at 43 degrees north at 9.7% prevalence rate, um, New York at 4.7, Maryland at 6.3, and Florida at 1.4. Um, and then going back to, this is the same authors as the last slide, where is justice at all? Um, so comparing similar latitudes, Maryland at 39 degrees north had a 4.3% prevalence and the country of Turkey had 4.86. So you can see that even across countries, there um, seems to be similarities with the latitude impacting prevalence. So a study was done within the United States um, by Weaver et al. And they noticed that there was a decreased level of depression in Southern residents. Um, they thought likely due to sunlight exposure in the South um, and also just like the climate impacts on seasonal affective disorder. 
The correlation of depression and location of residence is important because 60% of African Americans and 90% of rural African Americans reside in the South. Um, residing in the South was a protective factor for African Americans, particularly the authors believed because of a higher population of African American communities in that area, having more familial ties and then also having that church connection where they have some additional support that way. Blazer et al. said that within the South, there was a lower major depressive prevalence for rural residents compared to urban, um, regardless of race or ethnicity. And then they also found that major depressive disorders were twice as likely in urban communities. Um, but when Weaver et al. examined um, depression in Southern women specifically, they noted that there were higher rates for urban African-American women than those who are rural but higher for rural non-Hispanic white women than counterparts. So also taking into account that, you know, based on race or ethnicity, that could also vary or location, rural, urban. So kind of be aware of those stats. Turn it over to you, Dr. Mahoney, so we can learn more right. about the biological interventions. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna go into um, overview of biological interventions, but first I'm gonna start off by talking about more of some possible hypotheses, theories on, you know, why, and specifically, um, we're going to be talking about winter depression, on what um, some biological pathways might be contributing to why somebody would be experiencing this. So the first that I'm going to talk about is the chronobiology of seasonal affective disorders, specifically the photoperiodism hypothesis. So what that's referring to is the idea that in people who are vulnerable, so vulnerable individuals, that the shorter amount of daylight, which would be congruent with the winter months, would be a primary factor inducing the depression symptoms that come up during that time. And what this can help explain is one, why uh, winter months are more prone to this, but also why some people might have a waxing waning course in the winter. For instance, they might have less symptoms when it's very sunny out, more symptoms when it's cloudy out. So just one way to look at this, and this goes along the lines of the latitude statistics that were going up just earlier in you know some uh, research that I found. One study found winter seasonal affective disorder rates were significantly higher in U.S. regions. Um, of higher latitude, and another study found tw uh, with 22 studies examining seasonal affective disorder found a correlation between latitudes and rates of seasonal affective disorder. I will point out that the amount of correlation does vary a lot from study to um, study. What they showed is the ones that had more screening interventions looking at that risk correlation seemed to have a greater correlation than those of using more rigorous type of diagnostic assessments had less. But there does seem to be a correlation between them. And there are variabilities between certain populations as well. Um, in that people from Iceland tend to have lower rates of seasonal affective disorder compared to other populations at similar latitude, which could suggest a possible genetic component involved, uh, could also be a result of people who were more vulnerable over time migrating to other regions that had more sunlight. Although, one factor that does look at the genetic possibility is those from Iceland who migrated to Manitoba, Canada, ended up having lower rates of seasonal affective disorder symptoms than others in that region from um, other locations. And it also varies uh, from other places too. Ontario has a lower correlation. So it does vary a bit from population to population to, that does raise these questions. All right, next slide, please. All right. So looking at lights, shorter daylights, not a big surprise that we're talking about melatonin as a possible contributor to this. And one thing is melatonin does have some type of interaction with other functions in the body, uh, such as appetite, immune system, hemostasis, glucose regulation. So there, there's a biological aspect that may correlate to it. Um, and there have been variable results on the correlation of melatonin levels and rhythms of seasonal affective disorder systems. So it is variable a bit on how much melatonin could be playing a role with everything. Um, 
Now, light studies might suggest differently from the photo appears in the daylight hypothesis of the shorter daylight in that it's been shown that with light therapy, um, and you you think, you know, using more light therapy when it's dark, extending the amount of time that is daylight necessarily, um, that it'd be more effect, whereas in actuality studies have shown that just using the light therapy in the morning is just as effective as using it in the morning and the evening, so not fully extending. So that's one piece of data possibly going against this, although there is a factor with melatonin being a um, an influence in the circadian rhythm, there is a phase shift hypothesis as well as something that could be contributing to seasonal effect disorder with the idea that in the winter, there's a later dawn, which could contribute to a phase delay in sleep. So people are waking up later. And one study did sh uh, show they were measuring melatonin levels of melatonin onset to uh, have a specific specific measurement of the circadian rhythm, showed that 71% of the population that they looked at who were suffering from seasonal affective disorder were phase delayed versus 29% for phase advanced. So it does argue for the possibility of that being an influencing factor. Um, and it possibly raises um, the concern that there could be this other subpopulation too that has a different sleep pattern. Next slide, please. So going into just depression symptoms in general too, um, not surprising that serotonin finds its way in the mix with this. Um, and there are some evidence out there that suggests serotonin playing this role uh, within seasonal affective disorders, and that serotonin levels do show a seasonal variation. Um, there's There were studies in postmortem samples looking at serotonin levels in the hypothalamus, and they found that they were at the lowest levels in the December, January months, which would correlate with the possibility of this being influenced in winter depression. And that... There was also evidence um, shown that um, patients with seasonal affective disorder have an increased serotonin transporter activity in the winter. And why this is significant is serotonin transporter is going to be taking serotonin away from where it's acting into the presynaptic area. So higher serotonin transporter activity means less available serotonin to be acting at the receptors. Um, so higher serotonin transport, less serotonin acting receptors, possibly more depression symptoms. So that's one other correlation of where serotonin may be influencing these symptoms. And another uh, or other studies that have been looking at this correlation too, uh, we're specifically working with tryptophan, which is the amino acid precursor of serotonin. So less tryptophan, less serotonin, more tryptophan, more serotonin is they found that tryptophan depletion and inducing a tryptophan depletion, which would then affect serotonin, would precipitate a relapse in symptoms with people who had remission. That remission was brought on by light therapy before. So possibly that's serotonin influence. And with the tryptophan too, um, interestingly, with tryptophan depletion in those actively suffering from untreated seasonal affective disorder had no change in their symptoms. And that could uh, be an argument that there could be a floor effect in the winter of serotonin levels that further decreasing it didn't have um, any more effect. Next slide, please. Dopamine's another neurotransmitter um, that's been looked at for its influence in inducing a seasonal affective disorder winter depression. Uh, one reason to look at this is that dopamine is involved in some capacity in the circadian rhythm. Specifically, there's receptors at the level of the retina in the eye. And based on retina electroretinography, um, there did seem to be um, lower retinal dopaminergic activity in those suffering from seasonal depressive disorder. And at the level of the retina, dopamine has an inhibitory relationship with melatonin. So a decrease in dopamine involvement would then increase melatonin, which then going back to what I talked about with melatonin might induce some of these symptoms of seasonal affective disorder at that level. 
Um, interestingly, there's been shown to be a decreased dopamine transporter availability in the striatum of symptomatic seasonal affective disorder patients. And what you'll notice is this is the opposite of what I said for uh, serotonin. Serotonin had an increased dopamine transporter, so more getting sucked up with serotonin. This I'm saying is has a decreased dopamine transporter. And why this might be significant for seasonal affective disorder um, symptoms is we talked about some of those symptoms being like overeating, low energy, which goes into a possible hibernation type of response um, um, from a biological level that could be influencing seasonal affective disorder. But going back to dopamine, if there's more dopamine, that could be possibly interacting with the reward system in the brain, which might entice more of an overeating type of symptom. So one theory, one hypothesis of where that could be playing a role too. Next slide, please. So with all of these biological processes, um, you know, talking about a lot about light, daylight, circadian rhythm, uh, makes sense that some of the treatment that um, to help with seasonal affective disorder would be involving light sources. So the first thing that I want to go into is going into the neuroanatomy of how light is actually influencing things in the brain and might have uh, possibly an effect. And so looking at this diagram, we're gonna look at it as first light going into the eye. So light hitting the eye, and that's gonna stimulate the retinal ganglion cells uh, within the eye, which then is gonna produce a, a signal th uh, to the anterior hypothalamus via the retinohypothalamic tract, which then stimulates a, re a release of glutamate in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So now we're getting to more of the circadian rhythm regions of the brain, which then suppresses melatonin production in the pineal gland. So light, ultimately with all these pathways, decreasing the amount of melatonin. So you can see the opposite being true if there's no light, if we're in darkness. So you're not getting that stimulation, the retinal ganglion cells, not getting those projections, not hitting the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and then having more melatonin release. So that's the neuroanatomy, neurobiology thought behind light therapy. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of different light sources out there. And I'll go into a little bit when I talk about some of the evidence that there are different protocols have been studied for this. What I'm going to be talking about is the more evidence-based recommended treatment of using light therapy for winter depression. And that's the utilization of a 10,000 lux light box using fluorescent bulbs emitting white light. And once again, you'll see a lot of different boxes. It's good to be looking at the specific things of how much the intensity of light is being given off, as well as the exact type of light that's being released. Because there's other types of light therapy out there, such as blue light therapy. And with that, there is a lower amount of evidence of how beneficial it is. There's also some concerns about there possibly being more retinal damage related to blue light therapy. So evidence-based recommendation is using the 10,000 lux white light bulbs. General recommendation is using it for 30 minutes a day to use it as early as possible in the morning. So typical parameters I'd bring up for people is using it before, during breakfast. And the distance can vary a bit too. I find best practice just looking at the specific instructions for the light source that is purchased. They, they'll they have specific instructions of that. But generally speaking, it's around two to three feet. And a lot of times I get people say, how do you know it's that far away? How can I you know, get the general picture of two to three feet? And one little tip that I've had some people use is measuring out a piece of string that's that specific leg. Uh, length, tying it to the box so you can get a general estimate of how far it is away from the face. Going into some of the neuroanatomy and where it's helpful. So to keep your eyes open, the light needs to go into the eyes for it to be helpful. Now, the recommendation is not to look directly at the light as that could 
be harmful. It's also not the most comfortable. So you should be looking at about 30, 60 degree angle down. So for that, given that length of time, I'll tell people they can be doing activities. I mean, if it's during breakfast, you can be eating, doing work, reading. As long as you're in those general parameters, you should be good. Next slide, please. So light therapy, you know, think about light, but it doesn't come without any risks or any side effects. And there are no absolute contraindications for utilization of light therapy, but there are some factors that should be considered on recommendation of this and who should be using it. So one thing that comes up, it's light coming to the eye. So looking out for people who have a propensity for eye sensitivity to light. So some questions to possibly ask would be, is there a personal family history of ophthalmological conditions? Um, are they on any photosensitizing medications? And if the answer is yes to any of those, it could be considered to first have them talk to an ophthalmologist, get an ophthalmologist consult before going ahead with light therapy. There are some case studies out there that showed those using light ther therapy showed an increase in suicidality. Um, what I can say with that is it is a little bit difficult to piece out. One, it's being used for treatment of depression. Symptom of depression could be suicidality, as well as piecing out what other factors may have played a role in too, but something to definitely consider. And with this patient population, with talking about this disorder, it's just general good rule of thumb to be assessing suicidality anyways, but something to keep in mind too if somebody's using light therapy. There's also some evidence out there, although variable, on it inducing manic, hypomanic episodes, uh, specifically those with bipolar 1, bipolar 2 disorder. With similar to the suicidality risk, it's also difficult to fully piece out on what other factors may be playing a role in that too, versus just the light therapy being the only variable that changed. But something to very much consider if it's being recommended for somebody who does have a diagnosis of bipolar 1, bipolar 2 disorder. On the other side, I'll, uh, I've got some more common side effects of light therapy being agitation, anxiety, eye strain, fatigue, headache, insomnia, irritability, and nausea. And if those come up, one possibility could be increasing the distance away from the light box. The rule with the light intensity, though, is for every double distance that's done from the light therapy, the light source, it quarters the light intensity. So if the recommendation is two feet and you move somebody back to four feet, instead of 10,000 lux, they'll be getting 2,500 lux of light intensity. And why that's significant is it can still be used, although the recommended time of utilizing it increases. So at 2,500 lux, instead of the 30 minutes, it should be used for two hours, which not everyone has that amount of time in their, in their morning to be uh, sitting in front of a light box for two hours. Okay. Next slide, please. So there is fairly good evidence out there of light therapy being a reasonable treatment modality for winter depression. There are several meta-analyses that found clinical benefits with those using bright light therapy. Now I'll say going through the evidence, the difficult part is there being variations in protocols of light therapy, whether using 10,000 lux, 2,500 lux, anything in between, the distance it's used may, does create some difficulty with comparing studies and results. Although overall, there does seem to be benefit with light therapy. And when using light therapy, it does, and if somebody does get a response, it is relatively quickly. People will see a response within one to four weeks of starting bright light therapy. And the question being, how long do you continue it then, is treatment should continue at least two weeks past the typical offset in symptoms in spring and summer. So this is an important part to be getting that information when talking to the patients about like, when does it start, when does it end, and using that data to help 
formulate the full protocol of how long to use the light therapy. And just to go into, I'm using talking about 10,000 lux for light therapy of just how that correlates with various other lights. Uh, bright midday sun, 50,000 to 100,000 lux. So could be contributing to some fluctuations with people with winter depression because you're getting a good amount of light exposure in bright midday sun. Cloudy day, things drop drastically. And the light sources of light therapy with 10,000 lux are different than just lights you'll find in your home and in the office. So that is something that comes up occasionally. People ask. It is different. In indoor office lighting, 500 lux. Indoor home lighting, 250 lux. So just a lamp that you have in your house is not going to have that therapeutic effect. It needs to be that specific bulb. Next slide, please. So going into some more of the evidence and studies looking at light therapy and how that could vary from different populations is one study did investigate the response of light therapy between Black Americans and white American patients suffering from seasonal affective disorder. And what they found was there was no significant difference between the groups in terms of adherence to treatment or symptomatic improvement. So both groups were using the treatment. Both groups were getting significant benefit in the treatment. Where there was a variation between the groups was that the Black participants had lower remission rates post-treatment. And how the study defined remission rates was using the scale they're using, which was the SIGHSAD score of less than an equal to eight. And one possible factor that I was looking at that could be influencing is the Black American participants in the study did have a higher slightly higher score within the scale pre-treatment. So they, they would explain possibly why they would have the similar symptomatic improvement, but less remission rates as they didn't quite hit the eight and below score. Next slide, please. So this is going, this is a different type of light therapy outside of bright light therapy. And there's something called dawn stimulation that can be used, another type of light source that can be purchased. And what this does is this uses a much less intense light at bedside that gradually increases for 30 to 90 minutes for while the person's sleeping and concludes when the patient typically wakes up. So we'll gradually increase that intensity. And to give you an idea, it goes up to approximately 250 lux. So way, way lower light intensity than the bright light therapy. And there is, some, there is research behind this as well as it being helpful for treatment for winter seasonal affective disorder. But a specific population that this could be helpful with is those who particularly struggle with symptoms of difficulty awakening and morning drowsiness. So if they fall into this, this could be also a possible treatment modality. And also keeping in mind too, that it has a much less light intensity than that of the bright light therapy, only going up to the 250 lux. All right, next slide, please. All right, so now going off of this, we're going to talk a little bit about medications, supplements that can be used for seasonal affective disorder. So this does go into some of the talk we had about what could be influencing it, serotonin, dopamine. So Going in line a little bit with just regular depression, unipolar major depressive disorder treatment, it's not a big surprise that your SSRI class, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, would be the first line recommendation for pharmacotherapy in addressing seasonal affective disorder. And overall, and what you'll see as I go through all these different medications, all these different supplements, is the amount of evidence for them is specifically being studied for this purpose is relatively low. And there are a couple medications within the SRI class that do have evidence out there, one being fluoxetine. And there's a couple studies that did show similar benefit when comparing fluoxetine to bright light therapy. Uh, another one that has been looked at is Zoloft, uh, which did show sim uh, benefit compared to placebo in a randomized control trial, but overall evidence base, there's not as, near as much as that for 
your typical non-seasonal major depressive disorder. There is one medication that has been indicated for the prevention of seasonal affective disorders, and that's bupropion. There's evidence out there of that being beneficial. And how that can be used is starting treatment four weeks prior to the usual onset of symptoms and continuing two weeks past usual symptom off offset. So Another another piece of why it's very helpful to be getting that course, one, but diagnostically for um, diagnosing this of knowing when it's starting, when it's stopping, but it is important too when discussing these different treatment modalities that could be used. Next slide, please. Okay. So now I'm going to go into some supplements that and alternative treatments that you know have been thought of as possible benefits for winter depression and generally speaking the evidence space is very low for these so there's not a whole lot to put a strong clinical recommendation is although i do want to talk about them as they one have been looked at and two might be something that you come across so on them no surprise with some of the stuff i was talking about with um with serotonin is that the L-tryptophan. So talking about the amino acid precursor to serotonin. So thinking you give L-tryptophan, it could help with the depression. There are two small preliminary trials suggesting L-tryptophan is effective as light therapy, although evidence base is very small for, for this utilization. So can't necessarily put a clinical recommendation behind it with that limited research. Another possible uh, supplement that could be looked at is that of vitamin D. Another thing that makes sense when you're talking about winter, summer, daylight, vitamin D. And there are mixed results with using vitamin D specifically for the treatment of these symptoms. And a small study of only an N of 15, vitamin D was shown to have greater improvement in depression symptoms compared to light therapy. There's also studies that show that there's no real significant benefit, such as one looking at women 70 years and older. Uh, they were treated with 800 international units of vitamin D. That showed no benefit. And an interesting finding, too, is looking at depression, not depression, vitamin D levels between those suffering from seasonal affective disorder and those of healthy subjects is that just looking at the vitamin D levels, there was no significant difference in those two populations. So one consideration with vitamin D could be getting a level and supplementing as you would for any other uh, type of deficiency versus there's not a lot of evidence suggesting vitamin D just given as treatment for people who are uh, suffering from these symptoms. Next slide, please. So stuff we talked about before as well, melatonin. Makes sense that some people looked at this as possible treatment and very mixed results, although doesn't seem to be very helpful when taken in the morning or the evening, uh, five milligram dosing of melatonin didn't show any significant benefit. There was one very small pilot study looking at an N, 10, an N of 10, which did show an improvement in depression symptoms when it was taken in the afternoon. This could also look at some of these circadian rhythm changes, although with an N of 10, it's hard to make a clinical recommendation based off of that. Um, St. John's wort supplement can be purchased, been studied when utilized in just major depressive disorder and non-seasonal. It's also been some studies looking at its utilization in seasonal affective disorder. And Mixed results, a postal survey of 301 SAD patients reported improvement in those using St. John's wort, um, as well as two small single blind studies. So there's a comparable benefit to light therapy, although in general, not a lot of evidence there to support it being used for this specific purpose that we're talking about today. Next slide. So how to combine all this and put in the clinical recommendation. So first line, uh, first line therapy, thought to be for severe winter depression, which that can be defined as uh, having seven to nine symptoms in the criteria list. 
as well as looking at the PHQ-9 of 20 plus on that score, is that the first line therapy is antidepressant plus light therapy, starting with bright light therapy or dawn stimulation. First line recommendation is using the bright light therapy in the morning or pharmacotherapy alone. Now light therapy alone could be considered first line option with those of mild to moderate seasonal affective disorder. So below those criteria for winter, uh, severe winter seasonal affective disorder, although still diagnostic. Light therapy alone can be used such as bright light therapy or dawn simulation. Now, if those don't work, one option could be switching the antidepressants. You could also look at modifying the light therapy in that if somebody's using just bright light therapy, you could add on dawn stimulation. You could add on evening. There is a subset of the population that does seem to benefit from the evening bright light therapy. One thing that I do look out and I do ask patients too who are using light therapy is the influence that light therapy can have on, on the circadian rhythm, being that it's affecting melatonin. So that is something to look at too if you're using light therapy, if you're using the morning or night, is just looking at sleep rhythms. Next slide, please. And that's uh, it for me. So I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Fisher. Sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. That's very helpful information and will tie in somewhat with what I'm going to talk about um, in regards to the light therapy. Um, so next we are going to look at the psychological interventions for seasonal affective disorder. Um, so there has been some limited research into mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, what MBCT is, is a conglomeration of CBT, mindfulness, so specifically having participants um, impede those automatic thoughts by paying attention to the thoughts without judging them, including some meditation, which involves breathing and stretching. And then this all takes place in weekly sessions that are 45 to 60 minutes in duration and take place between April and June. Um, Overall, though, um, FLIR did a study in 2014, which found that it did not prevent depression in winter. Um, the reason why it was looked at is it has been found to be effective in other studies in preventing non-seasonal depression, but for seasonal depression, the research is just showing that it's not um, overly beneficial, at least as of now. Um, so looking at CBT sad then, this is arguably the um, most utilized treatment for seasonal affective disorder um, for the psychological perspectives. I do wanna put a caveat on this that a lot of the research in general with SAD seems to happen with Rowan um, and takes place in Vermont. And then there's also been a decent amount of research that's taken place in Scandinavia. So when you're looking at the results, know that it has been mostly done on a limited population. And so that is one area that I think could have some growth is generalizing that information. Um, Meesters, and I'm not going to try to say that name because I'm terrible with pronouncing names indicated that because SAD is repetitive and, at, and occurs at a consistent time, it would be beneficial to attempt to find preventative treatments, um, likely more easily than some of the other disorders that we treat where there may be more of an unpredictable onset. We do know that it happens at a, at a more regular interval, so it could be easier to find treatments to help prevent. Um, Forneris et al. did a um, literature review, however, and found that there was a lack of preventative treatments for seasonal affective disorder um, for psychological treatments. Um, Rowan has found that CBT was as effective if you do the CBT SAD for six weeks and, um, you know, consistently for those 12 sessions, that it could be as effective as 30 minutes of light therapy each morning. However, this study was not included because they don't consider it to be a preventative treatment if when you're first doing the treatment, the symptoms have already onset. So they did say that it was likely effective but couldn't be included in a preventative treatment. So that's something to consider for future research as well. Um, Mayor Hoff Young and Rowan looked at um, the remission of 17 individual symptoms. Um, so the symptoms that they looked at were depressed mood, work and activities, social withdrawal, genital symptoms, somatic symptoms, weight gain, appetite increase and increased eating, carbohydrate craving and eating, early and middle insomnia, 
hypersomnia, fatigability, feelings of guilt, anxiety psychic, anxiety somatic, and hypochondriasis, and then compared the results for CBT and light therapy together. Um, there were similar remission results for both of those treatments by the end of the, the treatment cycle, but light therapy did show more rapid improvement for early insomnia, psychic anxiety, hypersomnia, and so social withdrawal than the CBT SAD. Um, so knowing that if those are the symptoms that we're trying to target, it may be helpful to at the very least include light therapy in conjunction with the CBT to get that effect a bit sooner. So to preface this slide, um, this is looking at recurrence rates um, in, in studies that were done by Rowan um, for one year after initial onset of symptoms. And then the second study looked at um, recurrence rates for the following two seasons after doing the, the treatment modalities. So the study that looked at one follow-up year found that CBT had a recurrence rate of 7% in the following season, CBT and light therapy together at 6% and light therapy alone at 37%. Then the second study, which was a larger study, um, in the first year, the recurrence rates for CBT were 29% and for light therapy, 25%. And then when we looked two years out from doing the treatment, CBT was at 20%, 27% and light therapy was at 46%. Um, I know one of the things that I saw in my review of the literature was that um, light therapy can be a bit more challenging for people to consistently implement. Um, and so I wonder if that's part of the reason for the second year um, recurrence rate. So that's something to consider too if you're implementing the light therapy to cope ahead for that. Um, to try to encourage them to be using it consistently. In the second winter, CBT SAD was correlated with less severity of symptoms and more remissions. And the remission in first winter was more correlated with remissions and less severe symptoms in the second winter for CBT, which you can see in the recurrence rates. Um, so Camuso and Rowan in 2020, said that more severe depression was correlated with greater severity after treatment when it was assessed at both one and two years um, after treatment for both CBT SAD and light therapy. And I think that makes sense to us, right? Like if people are coming in with more severe depression, we would assume that they would get better, but it makes sense to us, I think, that they would still have greater severity of symptoms than their counterparts who maybe don't have as less severe depression when they start. Kanov et al. found that those with more cognitive concerns, so things like automatic thoughts, dysfunctional beliefs, um, at the beginning of treatment, were more likely to still have those um, following light therapy alone than if it was used in conjunction with CBT, which again, I think makes sense to us if you're using something to combat those automatic thoughts and cognitive distortions, it would make sense that they would decrease. Um, going back to Camuso and Rowan in 2020, they said that cognitive vulnerabilities, including dysfunctional attitudes, seasonal beliefs, brooding rumination, and preference for eveningness were not sufficient predict predictors of treatment outcome above and beyond initial depression severity. So again, going back to that severity being mostly correlated in their research with the outcome. The conclusion of treatment, those who preferred to be active in the morning tended to have lower levels of depression for both CBT SAD and light therapy which I think ties in with the research that you shared, Dr. Mahoney, about using the light therapy in the morning. Um, and so I wonder how much of that is correlated with people who are more willing to be up and do the light therapy too, um, could, could also be beneficial um, into looking into more. The results indicated that there were fewer recurrences of depression in the second follow-up study for CBT um, versus when looking at light therapy alone, which was commensurate with the study that we looked at um, on the last slide as well. Right. So we are going to talk about how to implement CBT SAD um, because I think that's why probably most people are here is to learn like what can we do in our own practices. And so I think Dr. Mahoney, you did a fantastic job sharing about the medication piece um, and what's beneficial there with light therapy. Um, so kind of going over how we compare that with some psychological treatment is as we learned from the research, going to be the most beneficial to people. So all of this, going over all of the sessions is going to come um, straight from Rowan, who you have heard in the previous slides, has most of the research on seasonal affective disorder 
um, CBT for seasonal affective disorder. So it's coming out of the therapist guide if anybody is interested in um, learning more about it. And there's also a participant guide that appears with it and has all the worksheets that they would use. So um, the sessions are comprised of um, 12 weeks or six weeks of groups and 12 sessions. So people are engaged in two groups per week. Um, each group is one and a half hours in duration. Groups typically start by early fall, um, but certainly by early February groups should have begun um, if it's a winter season um, affective disorder. And then they occur consistently. So the caveat to that is a lot of times due to the timing of that, it falls over a holiday break. So you would just coordinate with the, all of the members and be in agreement that you're going to skip one session, for example, for if people are visiting relatives or things like that over the holidays. Groups should have about four to six members, but no more than eight in order for it to be um, most effective. So you can keep track of what everyone's doing. And it's beneficial to have two leaders when possible. Um, going off of not skipping groups, the material builds on previous sessions. So you really need to make sure that people are willing to engage in all of the sessions and, and not miss. Um, the one benefit to CBT for SAD is that it's expected that you wouldn't need any maintenance groups. Part of it is developing that relapse prevention plan that we'll talk about at the end. Um, so they continue to use their skills and they plan ahead um, for things that could get in the way to continue to use them. So, um, so it consists of psychoeducation, behavioral activation, or what's called BA, cognitive restructuring, and then that relapse prevention plan that we briefly touched on in the last slide. Um, so the focus on challenging unhelpful thoughts would be the cognitive restructuring. So we want to help them change their thoughts related to winter, light decrease, cues of seasonal changes, any weather variances. Um, and we're going to examine cognitive impacts like maladaptive schemas, attitudes, automatic thoughts that again are related to those seasonal changes, um, changes in light availability, even cues that the weather may be changing can um, lead to um, some of the onset, so helping with restructuring some of those thoughts. Um, and then also looking at behavioral factors, um, such as the low level of reinforcement when doing activities to try to help increase those activities, and then the learned emotional and psychophysiological reactivity to low light that um, is correlated with stimuli in the environment. And then again, treatment ends with that relapse prevention plan, which should be very specific to each person. This is looking at an overview for the summary of the sessions. So um, week one, which again, remember um, each week has two sessions um, to get to those 12 sessions total. So week one in sessions one and two, they look at psychoeducation for seasonal affective disorder. Week two looks at behavioral activation. Weeks three through five will look at cognitive therapy. And then week six um, focuses on that relapse prevention planning. So in the first session, um, it's important to provide information about seasonal affective symptoms and potential causes, which Dr. Mahoney highlighted for us very well in his portion. So um, when you're going over some of the potential causes, you can review some of that material that he shared would be very useful. Um, you discuss CBT SAD as a method for managing and hopefully preventing ongoing symptoms through future years through education and then implementing the skills in an interactive manner. So you're going to be having people use some of their own examples to work through and you're going to help them with that. Um, you describe CBT SAD as focusing more on behavioral activation and helpful thoughts versus um, those unhelpful thoughts through cognitive restructuring. In the first session, like most things we do with therapy, it's important to talk about confidentiality and not talking about things that happen in sessions outside of there to maintain that. And then talk about the rationale for homework. So research really shows that people who do the homework, um, especially for CBT, because um, it is based on restructuring those thoughts and, and challenging them in the moment, um, improve the most. There's the most likely um, benefit. In session two, you are going to review again, seasonal affective disorder and symptoms. Um, being cognizant of 
their own symptoms and having them identify what are some of the cues that maybe seasonal affective disorder is setting in. Also reminding them that emotions are on a continuum. So sadness and depression are on a continuum. Um, everybody experiences them to some level and we want them to see when does it become problematic. Um, and also reminding them that because it's um, seasonal affective disorder is a cycle, we can stop the cycle both cognitively and behaviorally. We want to review the prevalence rates for seasonal affective disorder. Um, and again, any hypotheses that contribute to seasonal affective disorder, we want to um, help reinforce the information that they learned in session one through that. Um, so starting in session three, we are going to look at behavioral activation. So we will review behavioral activation overall. So we wanna talk about identifying, um, creating a happiness cycle. So if we have depressed mood and we engage in activities that we enjoy, it's likely that our depression will lessen and then we'll engage in more activities we enjoy and it can become a cycle of um, happiness. Whereas with seasonal affective disorder and other depressions, typically people have depressed mood, they're less likely to engage in activities. They feel more depressed and it becomes a cycle of, of that unhappiness or depression. Um, so helping them to see the differences in those cycles and that's why we're, we're really working with this method. Um, also reminding them that those people with seasonal affective disorder tend to engage in fewer activities they enjoy in winter or fall. Um, they may have lots of activities they enjoy in summer. And so helping them to gain that awareness of you know, the activity decrease that tends to occur with seasonal affective disorder. Less activity can be a symptom of depression, but it can also perpetuate it in that cycle. Um, so again, trying to stop it where we can. Um, for people who do CBT treatment, we know that the easiest place to stop that is typically with the behaviors, um, but also with thoughts at times. So we're going to try to change the cycle at both places. Right, are some strategies we can use to increase engagement in behavioral activation. We're going to try to work on changing those unhelpful thoughts, which can lead to a decrease in the behavioral activation and pleasant activities, and instead try to change them to more helpful or mo motivational thoughts. So what we're going to do is have our participants write them down, the motivational thoughts, and keep them in places that are easily seen to help motivate them throughout the day and engage in the activities. We're going to have them complete a pros and cons of engagement in BA, thinking specifically about the long-term consequences. So what are the benefits long-term if we're engaging in behavioral activation? We want to help them choose challenging but possible activities. So some people will try to jump in and do things that are you know, not reasonable, not feasible. So trying to help them come up with things that are challenging, but they can do. We also want to help them choose activities um, or think about a cope ahead for activity. So if something gets in the way of doing the activity, what's something that they can do instead? Having a backup plan, really. In session four, we're going to continue on with behavioral activation. So what we want to do within this session is look at activities that fall under these specific categories. So the first one is social activities. I think we all know what that is, but things like spending time with loved ones, engaging in social groups, things that get them more interactive with other people, building competency. So increasing activities that build that sense of mastery. So it could be like learning a new skill um, that might help them feel like they're mastering something, continuing with a skill that they've already done but could improve upon, fixing things, anything that helps with that mastery. Looking at activities that are incompatible with depression. So this for me, correlates with the opposite action of DBT a bit. We're going to look at activities that lead to them feeling happy, hopeful, less depressed, things that just can't occur at the same time as depression. And then aerobic exercise or what we refer to as cardio. So uh, brisk walking, running, swimming, those sorts of activities. Again, we wanna help them cope ahead. So some particular situations that people with seasonal affective disorder tend to run into would be feeling fatigued. So helping them cope ahead for that. If I'm feeling tired, how am I still going to push through and do these activities? Anhedonia, um, routine tasks that get in the way. So trying to balance pleasant valued and routine tasks. So that way they, they can include the pleasant activities while getting done what they need to. 
um, the preferred activity is not being available in winter. So we talked about how a lot of these people tend to have things they enjoy in summer, but they're not available in winter. So helping them um, find other options that are maybe similar or ways that they could do the activities in fall or winter if possible. Unhelpful emotions or thoughts that get in the way. So how can they thought challenge in the moment if they're having thoughts about not following through with the behavioral activation? We also want to teach participants to set goals specifically to help them increase activities, schedule them and follow through with them, recording their enjoyment levels. So that way we can keep track of that and see if there are any changes and then reinforcing engagement in the activities with rewards. We want them to start increasing activities starting the following, the following week um, with the goal of at least one activity for 10 minutes per day but knowing that that varies based on each person. So if somebody comes in and they're um, you know, doing an hour a day, that's fine. Let's try to increase it from that hour. But 10 minutes per day is the starting block for people who are really not engaged currently. Session five starts to look at that cognitive therapy component. So this is using thought diaries, Socratic questioning, and um, developing rational responses, determining core beliefs. Within this, we want to start teaching our participants the ABC model. So antecedent is the event that occurred. B is the belief or our thoughts about the event that we're a part of. And C is consequences, which is really within CBT an emotional response specifically. Um, knowing that for different people, different beliefs can yield different emotional responses um, just based on our backgrounds. And we'll get to that a bit more when we talk about core beliefs. Um, we also want to look at that unhelpful thinking. So knowing that some people in winter because of the seasonal affective disorder, or again, they kind of one can perpetuate the other, can get caught in those negative thought patterns or what we would call negative problem orientation. Um, for most of these people, in summer, they may occur less often, but in winter they increase. So helping them notice that pattern, see what some of those unhelpful thoughts are and really identifying the impact on mood that it's had on them. We can do this through doing the thought diary and we want them to review all possible automatic thoughts to situations, emotions, and current stressors. So the more we have, the better, because when we challenge them, we want to know all of the automatic thoughts that pop up related to different situations. In session six, um, we are going to look at some of those seasonal affective disorder specific automatic thoughts. So the main categories that they generally fall under are weather, winter for people where it's the winter seasonal affective disorder, seasonal changes or even cues that seasons may be changing, and then the variances in light. So we can provide an overview to them on cognitive distortions, which is literally just where events are distorted in an unhelpful way. We want to review with them case examples that you can bring and also personal examples. They can identify where it exists in their own life and have them identify their own distortions. So these are some examples of the cognitive distortions that we can look through. So all or nothing thinking, which is that black or white thinking. I have some examples there for you. Overgeneralization, which is assuming that because something happened once, it will happen again or ongoing. Those always or never statements fall under there. Mental filter, which is focusing only on the unhelpful aspects and ignoring when positive things occur. Disqualifying the positives, where we turn positives into unhelpful statements or thoughts. Jumping to conclusions, which can include mind reading, where we assume what other people are thinking and fortune telling where we predict the worst possible outcome out of a situation. We have magnification. So magnifying events um, that are unhelpful so they become catastrophic or minimizing when positive things happen. Emotional reasoning. Um, we know emotions aren't proof. Um, so this is people using their emotions as proof. Should statements. So shoulds, musts, oughts can be unhelpful. Labeling and mislabeling, so labeling people as categories or as words instead of their behaviors or labeling using extreme emotions. And then personalization, so assuming responsibility for events that are out of our control. So session seven continues with cognitive therapy. 
um, we are going to talk about how they can have control over their thoughts that follow the automatic thoughts. So while we, we don't have control over the thoughts that just randomly pop into our head, we can control what happens after that. Um, so we are going to introduce the Socratic method to them, which is where we are going to look at evidence for and against those automatic thoughts. We want them to look at the worst case scenario and identify if that happened, would it be survivable? Could I make it through? We want them to look at the best scenario. And then in between, we want to look at the most realistic scenarios. Um, we want to look at the impact of the automatic thought. So how do they act or feel based upon that thought? And then um, also look at how would they act or feel if they were able to change the thought to being a more realistic thought? Um, does the result differ for them? We would like for them to be able to problem solve the event. So doing um, pros and cons of solutions and also thinking about what would you tell somebody else if they were in your situation? So oftentimes people with depression, it can be really hard for them to get stuck in that cycle of really judging themselves and having a hard time seeing things in a more neutral manner. So it can be helpful for them to think about what they would tell a loved one. Um, so we want participants to evaluate their seasonal affective disorder related automatic thoughts, noting specifically previous personal examples that go against those thoughts that could maybe be used in their more realistic examples to challenge them, and then help them um, switch from an external locus of control to an internal locus of control when possible. So what under that is something that I could change or impact in that cycle. So now that we have looked at some of these responses, we want to help them work on creating those rational thoughts by adding D to the ABC model, which is dispute. So this literally involves disputing um, by thinking of other ways to view situations. So thoughts that are more realistic, more accurate, or more helpful. Um, they need to be helpful, but realistic in order to have buy-in, right? So if it's something that is maybe helpful, but it's not realistic, we're not going to get them to believe the, the new thought likely as much. It's helpful to have multiple um, rational or reasonable responses for each automatic thought um, and emotional state. Um, we also want to see how the different thoughts impact um, the emotional state that they're experiencing. So the more responses that we can have for each automatic thought, the more that they're going to be able to challenge it in the moment. So we'd like to have the more the better. And then again, we want to look at personal examples. Um, so that way they can look at their own specific thoughts that they're experiencing and challenge them directly. So in session nine, we are going to look at core beliefs, which really are our perceptions of the world, other, our, others, ourselves, and these thoughts begin in childhood. They underlie all of our automatic thoughts and they're pretty fundamental in things that we believe pretty pretty accurately to be true just because it's, it's how we were raised or what we just believe to be accurate about the world and others and ourselves. Most of the time, these thoughts are helpful, but in depression and with seasonal affective disorder, they can be unhelpful or negative. And for people with seasonal affective disorder tend to happen most in fall or winter. The core beliefs impact our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, and they're the reason why I may have different perceptions of things than perhaps Dr. Mahoney, because we were raised differently. We've had different life experiences. So we view things in different, different ways. So we want to help participants identify their core beliefs through um, the themes of their automatic thoughts. So one way we can do that is with the down, downward arrow technique, which is by asking them questions like, and what does that mean? Um, what does that say about you? How does that impact you? Why does that bother you? Um, what does that suggest about this situation or about you? So helping them continue down until we get to what that core belief is that's underlying these thoughts that are popping into their head. And we can also have them complete a core belief questionnaire if that's something that you have access to as another option. So in session 10, we want to talk about how core beliefs typically fall under these two categories of being unlovable or being helpless. We want to work on making any of those unhelpful core beliefs more helpful or positive. So the process is similar to those automatic thoughts um, and how we challenge them, but it tends to be more difficult for participants because these are thoughts that are more closely held as being true to them. 
And so it can be helpful to share that with people that this is likely going to be a bit more challenging for them than the automatic thoughts because they are held as being true since we're so young. Um, also, similarly to the automatic thoughts, we want to generate as many rational responses as possible to the thoughts. So for each core belief I have on the side here, um, how you are going to review them, you're going to rate the strength of the core belief from zero to 100%. And then you are going to write down evidence for the belief. However, you are going to put a but statement at the end of each one. So for example, the evidence for my belief may be that it's because that's the way that my mom told me that it has to be done. But there can be other ways of doing it and other families likely do it another way. So you're going to put in that but statement to try to challenge it there a bit. Then you're also going to put in any evidence you have against the belief, write down new beliefs that you have, rate the strength of the new beliefs on that same zero to 100 scale, and then rate the strength of the old belief after you have a new belief generated to see the impact on it. In session 11, we are going to start looking at that relapse prevention plan um, while continuing to have them work through any core beliefs that um, still have to be addressed. So within the relapse prevention plan, we want to focus on how they can maintain their gains while also coping ahead and preparing for future seasons. So like we talked about thinking about things that could get in the way, major stressors like relationships, work, health, responsibilities that may come up that sort of thing, we wanna cope ahead for that as well. Um, increasing BA and continuing with thought challenging, especially in future seasons when they know that the onset is likely to occur and helping them create new goals for themselves and their relationships. Because as people are decreasing their depression or in this case, seasonal affective disorder specifically, um, oftentimes they may need to create new goals for themselves. They're in a different place. They might be more motivated, feeling better, so we wanna help them on that journey as well. The final session, session 12, you provide a summary and review material from all of the previous groups, review their relapse prevention plans, provide closure through thoughts and feelings of different group members, things that were, were successful or helpful. And we also want to help them internalize that success. So sometimes our friends with depression can try to pass the success on everybody else, like, will you help me get better? Or, um, you know, it's just because I did this treatment. So we want them to really internalize that and say like, I put in the work to get here. I attended all of the sessions. We want to emphasize the importance of reviewing the material and practicing the skills ongoing. Um, we saw that when that happens, the recurrence rate is less. So we want them to continue to use that when they can predict that it will be impacting them in the future. And then seeking help when needed, whether it's from their psychiatrist for medication management, or it is to come in and, and get some assistance if they're struggling with you know, following their relapse prevention plan, that's appropriate too. We are going to switch gears to our case example. Um, so Gwen is a 63-year-old white bisexual cis female residing in Eastern Washington state. During her intake, she acknowledged that starting in November, she had begun to have decreased energy, increased appetite, lack of interest in activities, and sleeping excessively. She was no longer engaging with friends and only attending work. In gathering her history, Gwen noted she had experienced improvements in her mood when doing light therapy, but admitted she was not consistent in implementation um, since five years ago. So some potential recommendations that we have in, a, in this case was to use CBT SAD, um, focusing again on the psychoeducational component. So, you know, what symptoms does she experience specifically and how can she use the treatment modality to help with the, the thought challenging through the Socratic method, ABC, um, challenging those automatic and core beliefs, and then increasing be behavioral activation. So because it she was isolating more. We want her to engage more with her friends um, and, to, and cope ahead. So if she's not feeling motivated to engage with them, how can she challenge that? Establishing a plan for continued implementation. Um, so that ties in with the light therapy piece, right? Like how can she cope ahead to continue to be more consistent with that? Um, and then on Dr. Mahoney's end, the medication management and seeking a psychiatrist when needed.
Hello, everyone. <clears throat> well, it is now time for our Q&A. So I will open it up for questions. I do have one here for everyone. Um, have CBT for SAD been adapted to different behavioral health settings, such as integrated primary care, partial hospitalization, or residential treatment? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. So I'm currently in the residential facility. I have been in PHP IOP previously through Rogers. I would say that because we have the depression recovery or focus line, which specifically looks at um, depression and behavioral activation and CBT. Uh, we also incorporate DBT into that program, but we, we can individualize it because we are using those skills already. So we do have a line specific for a variation of this type of treatment, but because the treatment is also individualized, we can tailor it to people if they have seasonal affective disorder. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, another question we have here is, have there been studies comparing MBCT and CBT for SAD? Mm -hmm. So not specifically for SAD, there has been some research um, for a non-seasonal depression. For seasonal depression, the um, only thing that I have seen, and granted this is just me, so there's always the possibility it could be out there, um, is that one literature review that looked at um, preventative treatments. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, they didn't include Rowan's CBT studies because they didn't view them as being preventative. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the research that I've seen shows that MBCT is not effective for seasonal affective disorder. Okay. As a preventative treatment at this time. Okay. And, and do we know when patients can benefit from mindfulness versus cognitive restructuring? Yeah, so I think um, specifically for, for SAD, I would focus more on the cognitive restructuring component just because that falls under the CBT SAD, which has been found in research to be more effective. Um, I'm, I also enjoy DBT, so I can see the benefit in really everyone being more mindful. So I think people can still incorporate that into their lives if it's something that's beneficial to them, but it would be outside of the scope of the CBT for a seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. um, another question I'm seeing here is, is it beneficial to include sleep hygiene strategies at bedtime? Yeah, so I would say, and Dr. Mahoney, I'm sure you may have things to say about sleep as well. I mm -hmm. personally am a proponent that everybody can benefit from sleep hygiene. So shutting screens off before bed, not exercising really close to bedtime. Um, I, I just feel that everyone can benefit from that, regardless of diagnosis, or even if you don't have any diagnoses, everyone can benefit from getting good sleep. Yeah, yeah, and going into some recommendations that are out there for treatment as well, sleep hygiene fits in there, exercise fits in there. So a lot of those elements that you see for just depression in general, also very much fits in with seasonal depression too. There's also an extra consideration with those influences in sleep and its possible influence in symptomatology that can make sleep hygiene keeping to a consistent sleep schedule particularly beneficial. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. Um, do we know what the relapse rate is of SAD? Is there any literature out there on that? Yeah, so that would be the recurrence rates um, that I reviewed at least for um, with the CBT and light therapy treatment. Okay. And are there benefits of receiving booster sessions for CBT? Um, so the author, um, Rowan, says that there is not, um, that you it's not necessary. What we would just recommend is that people continue to use the skills that they've learned in the initial sessions ongoing. Um, but again, if there's a reason why people are struggling to continue to use those skills, then they may need a follow-up individual session with someone to talk about what's getting in the way and doing a new cope ahead for um, implementing the skills. I also see a question here. Um, as far as like melatonin use goes, 
is that it, it, it seems like there is some evidence that at least with very low dose melatonin, it can be effective, but what are your thoughts on that? Or are you aware of anything else, Dr. Mahoney, that can be effective for sleep? So once again, when I was researching this, where I was looking specifically at the utilization of these agents for seasonal affective disorder. So when using melatonin for this specific, specific indication, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence out there. Now, you can break down some of the symptoms of, of this and look at different treatment modalities, such as, is there a phase delay? And there's a, there's a lot of evidence of using melatonin, even, even using uh, light therapy to help switch the circadian rhythm. I would say that the evidence for that, uh, at least that I've come across is more specifically for using it for that purpose of circadian rhythm disorder treatment than that of specifically of seasonal affective disorder. So it could be beneficial. It'd be breaking it more down to a specific symptom within the, se the seasonal affective specifier. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. Um, also, just wondering, are there best ways to work with sad clients when they're not open to inter interventions? Mm -hmm. So I think in that case, you would have to look at what's getting in the way of willingness first, um, would be where I would suggest to go. Is there a reason why they're unwilling to do the interventions? Um, sometimes that can be useful. Reinforcement when possible, I think, especially if it's a younger person that can be helpful, like kind of what's in it for me. So helping them look at what are some of the long-term consequences that they engage in, in some of the treatment as well, um, or providing their own reinforcement for engaging in things. Mm -hmm. Possibly taking it from a motivational interviewing approach, but I think a big factor, at least with some of the interventions I talked about is what could be the barriers, what could be getting in the way, were they using light therapy in the past, but they were having issues with vision, their eyes, sensitivity with it, and making modifications based on that if needed. I also see a question in here. Um, are there specific studies on patients with, you know, bipolar disorder with seasonal affective disorder, or is there any difference um, from patients with unipolar depressive disorders with seasonal defective, uh, affective features? Yeah, yeah, I don't have a lot of the specifics on there. Uh, specifically, I was more looking at the winter depression, unipolar depression. And that's where a lot of the studies in terms of these interventions have been focused on. Uh, it should be considered that that is a whole different subset, too, of these symptoms. And it very much come into from a pharmacological standpoint, if that's where things were were going on and looking at just to, if you're going to give a SSRI, for instance, that'd be a very important thing to look at. Um, yeah, and I would agree for the psychological interventions, much of it was done on unipolar depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you do also hear about the use of vitamin D, and I know that was something that was mentioned as an alternative means to, to treat. Are there any other nutritional interventions that could help with SAD? So nutritional, I would point out to one of the big symptoms of it being overeating, uh, specifically one of the primary components of eating that's specific to this type of illness is the carbohydrate craving. So going from a dietary perspective, that'd be an important part to look at and just modifying what somebody's eating throughout the day. But in terms of specific supplements, no, there's not a lot of evidence. And as I brought up, even using vitamin D, there isn't a strong evidence of using that to treat mm -hmm. symptoms, but diet should be very much looked at. And if there are concerns with that, I know we often recommend that people speak with a dietitian specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're blessed because we have dietitians here, and I think sometimes that can be taken for granted, but definitely something to pursue if you are in outpatient practice um, and you would like for somebody to have their diet looked at more specifically. I recommend that very frequently because they're the experts on that more than we are. And do you know if there's like certain patients that tend to benefit from evening light therapy? That's another question we had here. 
Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a subset of population that did seem benefit from evening light therapy that I mean, that's a consideration too of adding on evening light therapy of morning bright light therapy. The first recommendation, though, is, I'd say is go off of the general population without knowing one thing that could influence the decision is if you're getting information of if somebody's phase delayed versus phase advanced. As I brought up in the statistics, there is a subset of the population that was phase advanced versus phase delays. I think it was like a 29% of the population they looked at. So if you're looking at it from a circadian rhythm factor that's influencing things, it could vary a little bit. And there wasn't specific studies of showing like what population benefited from evening light therapy. There wasn't evidence or there wasn't anything in those studies determining if like these were phase delayed patients, phase advanced patients, but there is a subset of the population that does benefit from evening light therapy. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. I also see a question here um, in the chat with all the sleep issues that child adolescents with ASD have. Is there any research that speaks to how SAD shows up with this population? Do we have any information to share on that? I did not see anything with that. I'm uncertain if you did, Dr. Mahoney. No, no. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, I did, didn't come across a whole lot of, you know, specifying it within just a whole lot of populations in general. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I'm not too sure. I think, you know, like I shared before, a lot of the research for the psychological interventions has taken place in Vermont or Scandinavia. So I think we're just kind of at the, the newer side of researching this. It's something that definitely could use more research on specific di other diagnoses that correlate with it. Um, more specifics on the symptoms and how they're impacted with more diversity, how can different populations be impacted. So I think it, we're really just sort of at the infancy stage in this area. Yeah. Um, kind of also talking about child and adolescent, are we aware that light therapy is effective with children and adolescents? Is there anything out there to suggest that? Oh, I, I mean, I specifically work with adults, so mm -hmm. my knowledge of child adolescence is a little thin. I, I'm not I mean, for most of the, any, yeah. I'm not certain if there's any research on it. I know that it was approved by um, our psychiatrist to use for some of our adolescents on our focus unit. So yeah. I'm not sure if that's based on research or if it was it was just deemed to be helpful based upon experience. And from a you know risk benefit side, I'd say it's, I'm not too familiar from an evidence based standpoint on its you know demonstrating benefit in that population. From a side effect standpoint, again, light therapy is pretty low, so that could be something that's considered in utilization in various populations. Sure. Um. Are there any online CBT programs available for SAD that you would recommend? Um, none that I am aware of. Um, I specifically went through the, the manual for therapists and I felt that it was very laid out. There are specifics in there. There's lots of information. Um, so if people would like to use this type of therapy, I would really suggest getting that manual by Rowan. And then um, there were some questions here in the chat just asking about how Rogers uses light therapy in our programming. And I know you guys both mentioned that we have used it occasionally. So I don't know if you want to be able to just speak about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, on, I on I work residential treatment and on my unit, we have a um, light source 10,000 lux that I utilize on a patient to patient standpoint. Um, so bring it out, use it for 30 minutes in the morning. I, I personally will, I mean, since I come in the morning, basically when we would start using it, I, I do like supervising the first thing. Cause if there's one thing with light therapy, it's 
it's not always used the recommend the recommended way and there could be a lot of ways to use it there is a lot of differences in protocols but i'll hear a lot of people you know I, I'll, I'll first have them describe to me how have you used it in the past sometimes i'll be like yep that sounds sounds right sometimes i'll be like you know no maybe here here's let's try it this this different way and i'll monitor them uh look at them just briefly when they use it the first time just to make sure that they're using it appropriately and that's the benefit that i have in residential care is i get to i get to see them actually using it to make sure it's being used per the most evidence-based recommendations all right i do see one more question i think we have time for here um, when a patient's motivation is very low because they're just, you know, they're not motivated, what is the best way to try and help them raise their motivation to engage in some of the behavioral activation that we spoke about? So I think, you know, the reinforcement wherever we can, whether that's internal, you know, telling themselves that, reminding themselves of their values, which also ties into behavioral activation, um, but how do how does getting up and getting motivated and engaging in these things tie into their values? Are there ways that they can reinforce themselves in the short term? Ways that they can reinforce in the in the long term? Um, sometimes having somebody help hold you accountable. So having a, a BA buddy who maybe is going to engage in some of the activities with you, or a loved one who's going to call and check in and hold you accountable and say, "Did you do this today?" can be really useful. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. That is all the time that we have for questions today. Remember, if I did not get to your question, please feel free to send an email to webinars at rogersbh.org, and we will follow up with you. Many thanks um, to you, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Mahoney, for taking your time to share your valuable insights with us and answering all of our questions today. We really appreciate that. Before we conclude, I'd like to ask our presenter to share a few additional resources that you may have on this topic with our participants. Yes, so you can go to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America or the National Institute of Mental Health um, and knowing that um, the ADAA um, offers expert reviewed content, so that way you can supplement that to treatment and the NIH website um, has stuff in both English and Spanish, so you can connect with more individuals that way. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Well, that about wraps it up, everyone. I just want to remind our participants that those of you who meet the required time commitment will be eligible for CE credits. Within the next 30 minutes, you will receive an email with a link to your personal dashboard on ce-go.com where you will be able to access PDFs of the PowerPoint slide as a handout and complete a list of references. Those of you who met the time requirement to qualify for CE credits will need to complete the evaluation. So you can download that with your CE certificate for this event. If you have any other questions about this follow-up email, please contact our support at ce-go.com so on behalf of everyone at Rogers, we look forward to partnering with you to help support our patients. We appreciate your time. Thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon.